Okay, here we go. Our next, uh, our next talk is uh, Bigfoot Skeptics, Abominable Science. Abominable Science. Your moderator is going to be Blake Smith. He, of course, is the host of the uh, Monster Talk podcast, which you have to check out. It's so much fun. Here is the haiku. Lonely Yeti sits, pining for Bigfoot's agent, needs to get more gigs. Please welcome Blake Smith. Thank you. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here at the amazing meeting. Um, I think you've probably heard some really interesting stories so far if you've been attending the sessions on uh, miracles and frauds and all kinds of fake medicine and uh, misguided attempts at science. But today we get really amazing because we're going to talk about monsters. So, which is what I'm sure many of you have been waiting for. Our panel today includes Sharon Hill, who does the Doubtful News website, and she's a HuffPo contributor. We've got Daniel Loxon, who does Junior Skeptic. He uh, has written many children's books, including a fascinating one on evolution that I think is great for any kid. Uh, he also is the co-author of this book, Abominable Science. Don Prothero as well, who's written two books in backstage here just now, and uh, many others, uh, who's a paleontologist and uh, just a wonderful guy. Uh, they're actually here, we're promoting this book, Abominable Science. I have probably more than 200 paranormal topic books in my book collection. And um, I, this is by far the most well-cited and well put together and beautiful book on cryptozoology that I've ever seen in my life. If you don't buy a copy, you're missing out. I just wanna say that, it's wonderful. Uh, to, to begin this talk, we're gonna let Don do a short presentation that's gonna sort of set the tone for this. And uh, without further ado, Don Prothero. Thanks so much. Uh, Karen Stolz now, as you saw, was on the program. She's in the middle of a deadline, right in the middle of our meeting. So you saw her running around. She's upstairs editing right now, sad to say. Um, as uh, Blake very nicely said, we have a new book out. Uh, Daniel and I will be out there signing it after this and several more times this afternoon when there are breaks, if you're interested. And it's a four-year labor on our part, actually more than that. In Daniel's case, he's been working on this most of his life. And it brings together a collaboration of Daniel, who's been an amateur cryptozoologist to start as a child, and then grew into a skeptic as an adult. And my own co component of it is as a, a kid who grew up with dinosaurs at age four and never matured. And uh, now uh, coming at it as a scientist, a paleontologist with background in areas relevant to cryptozoology. So uh, what we tried to do in this was not just talk about one particular type of cryptid like Bigfoot or others. There's actually five in there that we dealt with at length and two more we had to leave out because of length. Uh, but to talk about the scientific method and how it works and in particular how the scientific method is important in this context of what we have dealt with for decades now with these cryptid, cryptozoology hunters and, and so on. And uh, the, one of the first things you'll find, of course, is when you deal with it, that uh, they, they have the evidence uh, ranking all backwards, right? The evidence that they value the most and what most crypto hunters are crazy about is what they themselves experience, personal experience or anecdotes of other people who claim to have seen Bigfoot. And as those of you who know uh, come to this amazing meeting more often than not, there's uh, lots of problems with that, which I'll mention in a second. So you'll see there on the slide, it's better to think of things in terms of what scientists consider good evidence and not such good evidence. The best possible course, if it ever happens, which I'm not putting any money on in Vegas or anywhere else, uh, is actual physical remains, something that is uh, more than just, uh, you know, just the usual. Uh, a bone, a skeleton, a tooth, or even better still, a carcass or a live animal, all of which have never been uh, obtained. Um, then, of course, the sliding scale down goes really fast. So there are lots of videos, there are lots of stuff out there, but as all of you know in this business, videos and photographs are extremely easy to fake, and now most kids can do Photoshop well enough to do them themselves. Um, and then there's the crummiest evidence, stuff that you can make up real easy, as people have done for decades, from you know footprints and all the rest, which can be faked so easily. And then, in my, certainly in my personal view, the worst possible evidence is personal experience, which is the reverse of what cryptozoologists do. Because we all know, if you've been to these meetings, we are great at deceiving ourselves. 
We have all sorts of ways in which our mind sees things that aren't there or plants things in there that we want to believe are there. Uh, we know not to trust eyewitness testimony. The legal profession is gradually reaching that point where they too no longer take eyewitness testimony as much as they used to, thanks to people like Elizabeth Loftus and others who have been at this meeting before explaining how easily it can go wrong. Um, many of you have seen the famous video that I didn't want to put the link in here for time reasons, uh, the famous gorilla and the basketball video where you're, you're forced to concentrate on a team of two basketball teams throwing a basketball back and forth and you're asked to count how many times the white shirt team passes the basketball and if you do that properly and focus just on what they're doing, you do not see a gorilla walk right through the shot. Okay, if you know that's coming, of course, I've ruined it for you, but in any case, uh, that's a classic example of attention dis uh, uh, disorders that you can easily miss things. Uh, uh, two examples that we put in the book here of classic cases where eyewitnesses turn to be very wrong, in this case, tragically wrong. A famous case uh, in 2004 where a hunter saw, he was out hunting, hunting hogs, he saw something moving in the distance, someone called out hog, he took a shot at it, it was actually the good toboggan cap his son was wearing, and he killed his own son. And then the famous, well, as you remember this case from 2002, the famous DC sniper. Uh, they were, police were given leads to look for a white van with white shooters, and they actually, they actually caught these guys several times in, in uh, various types of roadblocks and let them go because they were looking for white shooters and a white van, it turned out to be two black guys in a blue, blue sedan. Uh, these are kinds of things where eyewitnesses just basically give us nothing to go on. And then, of course, the long record of things like people say, say they saw something and then when you actually have a way of checking it, they put in memories that were not there. Uh, lots of ways in which as long as you watch you know, what happens here, you'll see that we can easily uh, deceive ourselves and we often realize, don't realize we're doing it. Uh, plus, when you're dealing with, say, with an, a cryptid like the Mukele Bambembe in Africa, there's different standards of what's real and not real if you're in a different culture. And for many cultures, mytho mythological features, things they've seen in hallucinations are just as real to them as what is what, what we would call real. And we are, are cannot necessarily take their idea of reality at face value when we're talking about ours. Um, so you have to be very careful. These things are very slippery, and yet this is what cryptozoologists dwell upon, the largest point. I won't say much about the definition of cryptozoology. It's basically, yes, we're discovering new animals all the time, but they're usually fairly conventional animals. They're a new species of cattle or a new species of peccary or, or a new species of monkey or bird, which most people wouldn't consider that startling. Uh, the last really startling animals to be found were found better than a century ago. The mountain gorilla in 1901, the Komodo dragon in 1912, the copy in 1901. Uh, there were things found since then, like the kupri and the chakwa and peccary, nobody would have noticed they were different until a zoologist actually looked. Uh, so that one of the things you'll hear cryptozoologists say, and this is a good point to discuss if you're interested, oh well, you know, like for example, the coelacanth wasn't found until 1938. Uh, well, now the deep sea's a different game, right? The deep sea has lots of things we haven't yet found. But uh, talking about the animals that are normally part of cryptozoology, they're air breathing, either land creatures or air breathing sea creatures, that's a totally different game altogether and it's not a fair comparison. Plus, the coelacanth lives extremely deep waters and in a the world where not a lot of fishing had been done until they were found. Now, one of the things that's really surprising and really interesting about this, especially if you follow it over time, which is one of the things that we do in our book, is talk about how these uh, myths have grown over time and been propagated over time, is that they tended to be much more believable and much more common in the old days. And what we're seeing now is a, a sort of a law of diminishing returns. We're getting fewer and fewer uh, sightings that make any sense. And in many cases, the sightings are dropping off quite a bit. And uh, what it, you can do this in zoology. It's, uh, it's basically like a law of diminishing returns. How many new species you expect to find given certain constraints? So the plot you see there on the bottom of the screen, uh, knowing that the discovery curve of new species every year, which is that ascending curve you see in the left half of the plot, those plots almost always taper off and come to a, pretty much a flat slope at the very top because at some point you really pretty much reach a point where there's not much in the way of new things to discover. And this has been done with a number of different large animal groups. Okay, um, so, and that's it's seen very effectively, uh, especially in parts that Daniel worked on in our book where he looked at the cultural effects, how much cryptozoology is pretty much dictated by whatever copycat phenomenon you want to dictate. So Daniel shows very effectively that probably the modern version of the Loch Ness Monster was inspired by King Kong. For those of you who know the original, uh, original King Kong with the, the uh, uh, early stop motion uh, animation, there is a sea creature in there that pretty much is a dead ringer for what Nessie became the year later. 
And so there's a very strong line of evidence that Daniel points out nicely that King Kong probably spawned the Loch Ness Monster. Take that as your take home line. Uh, uh, another example, which we're not able to include in the book, the, the legend of the Chupacabra from uh, Central and South America, Latin America, uh, as Ben Radford is not here at this meeting, uh, is able to show, it comes from one lady who watched the movie Species with Natasha Henstridge, where she goes from being a beautiful woman to a strange creature, and uh, the monster Sill in that thing looks just like her hallucination of Chupacabra. And then Chupacabra was spread all over the Latin world, almost within a year or two, instantaneously. And then especially after the famous Christina show, Christina is like the Oprah of, this, of the Latin world, uh, when it was on her show, all of a sudden Chupacabra was in every country in Central and South America. Very non-biological pattern. Now, uh, something else that's commonly a part of the uh, cryptozoology mythology is this idea that there's so much left to find in the land. There, the world is unexplored. And when you know, the pioneers of cryptozoology, I, Ivan Sanderson, who was a genuine zoologist and did roam the jungles, started their careers, that might have been true. But the world of inaccessible, unknown regions is changing very rapidly. In fact, it's changed in a way that's probably never conceivable. Uh, if you've ever traveled the Pacific Northwest, uh, one of the things that strikes you, and no matter how well the logging companies try to hide it, is that how much of the Pacific Northwest has been logged, and logged, and logged. So on the bottom picture there, just a handful of these shots you can get from just low angle aerial views of clear cutting. The forest is nothing like it was when supposedly Bigfoot was first roaming around. In fact, my co-author Daniel spent his childhood as a shepherd in these clear cut areas. So they're very common and it really represents very much less forest than most people give it credit for. Or uh, think about what's going on now with satellite imagery. You can click on uh, Google Earth, and you can see better than any generation ever in the past could see, down to resolution the size of a meter or so in most cases. Uh, you could look for Mokele Mbembe or Bigfoot yourself from satellite. Okay, it's that easy to see it from space. And I show an image there from Google Earth that I captured, and the, the references are in the book if you want to look it up yourself. You can see elephants from space easily. Okay, and Mokele Mbembe is supposed to be bigger. All right, so this is the kind of thing that is seldom mentioned, but it's actually quite easy now to really follow the world and you can do it from your laptop. Um, and the other point coming with this, how much this world is actually seen by people who are not cryptozoologists, uh, real biologists travel through Africa and they travel through the forest in North America all the time. They really know they're wild animals and they're not the ones who report Bigfoot. It's people who are amateurs about biology wandering around and every strange sound they don't recognize is Bigfoot. And I love this little cartoon. It just appeared online a week ago, so I stuck it in at the last minute. Uh, you'll see the top caption there. Percentage of the U.S. population carrying cameras everywhere they go, every waking moment of their lives. And you see in the bottom, in the last few years, a very little fanfare who conclusively settled the question of flying saucers, lake monsters, ghosts, and Bigfoot. Um, that's really, to me, one of the most powerful things. There's a rumor going around, I don't know if it's true or not, that Spielberg himself said he no longer believes in UFOs and it's because everyone has a cell camera. Now, I put into this book mostly my professional training as a biologist and a geologist. I had to do both to become a paleontologist. And as biologists especially, we know a lot of things about animal populations, maybe not known at the time of Ivan Sanderson or the early pioneers of cryptozoology, but certainly known right now. And it's inexcusable that people who actually think they're doing biology don't know these things and shouldn't be paying attention to them. But there are lots of things that, you know, occasionally hear these mentioned. Uh, but they don't have to, have to often get put together in a framework of what a field ecologist, for example, thinks of routinely and trained to think of. Uh, for example, first of all, every cryptid is not a singleton, right? The Loch Ness Monster, or there is not one Bigfoot that lived forever, right? They've got to be a population. And the more you see of them, the bigger the population has to be. And that you never run into this thinking, well, why are we never seeing two Bigfoot together? Okay, you never run into the question, well, why is there not more of these things? The more there are, the more likely we should be seeing good sightings and actual traces. And the exact opposite is the case. Um, and in particular, in biology, it's well known for land mammals especially, larger animals require larger home range to sustain them as biological organisms. Uh, there's an actually clear-cut formula there, which I put on the screen if you're interested in the math of it. Very straightforward relationship between body size and how, much you can, how many animals they can sustain in a given area. And you do that calculation, the range area, especially the things like Mokele Mbembe and Loch Ness Monster, is not big enough to actually sustain a population of Mokele Mbembe or Loch Ness Monster, okay? And you, depending on how many Bigfoots you expect to be out there, and every state in the union has one about once a month, uh, you pretty much can 
make that sense either. And most of the lakes in which the lake monsters live are actually not big enough to support a lake monster. Now, as a geologist also in my training, there are many geologic constraints, and one in particular that's really important for all the lake monsters, not just the uh, Lake Ness monster, but also Lake Champlain monster, Champy, and Lake, uh, you know, there are many of them, as you know. Uh, but the thing that's almost always glossed over, or just mentioned briefly, and then never really thought about, every single one of those lakes was under a mile of ice 12,000 years ago. And there are 24 separate glaciations in the last two and a half million years that have covered those lakes repeatedly. And we're talking about a thickness of ice similar to what's on top of Greenland right now. So you have to do some very strange supernatural biology to get organisms in those lakes once the ice melts back. None of those lakes, by the way, have an uh, outlet to the ocean. So unless there are aquatic creatures that can crawl across enormous distances on land to somehow end up in a lake, that pretty much rules out Nessie right there, okay? Along with Champ and all the rest. Simply cannot get those guys out there, unless of course you want your animal frozen and ice and then you're talking about sci-fi. But you're pretty much talking about sci-fi. Anyway, um, anyway, and then as a paleontologist, this is something I can speak to directly from my training, sure the fossil record isn't perfect, but for large animals, the fossil record is excellent because large animals leave large bones and they're much more likely to be preserved. So we can much more great confidence say when you don't see a large bone of something, it's almost certainly no longer in existence, at least in the area where we collect them. And in particular case of, say, Bigfoot, okay, we have an outstanding fossil record of Ice Age and post-Ice Age mammals in North America. Literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of specimens of most species that live in North America. A gigantic collection. I mean, I work at La Brea Tarpons alone where they have close to three million bones, okay? We can be pretty confident that even rare animals are sampled. And we do have a handful of rare Ice Age animals. Not once do we get anything from Bigfoot, or any primate for that matter, anywhere in the last 45 million years in North America. That, I think, is very strong negative evidence. Um, and this is true also in Africa and elsewhere. There's excellent fossil records since, for example, in the case of Michele Bambembe or the, the plesiosaur that's supposedly the Loch Ness Monster, excellent evidence that both those animals are no longer around after 65 million years from every continent of the world. And that's not weak ne negative evidence, that's strong negative evidence. So I'll finish then with the point, well, why should we take cryptozoology seriously? And here is where what Daniel and I sort of differ a bit. Um, I really fear that it is a sort of pa gateway drug to bad thinking and critical sloppiness and so on, anti scientific thinking. On the lower right there, of your, or lower left of your slide, are the guys who now chase Mokili Mbembe, some of them also chase Loch Ness Monster, and they're all creationists, okay? The only ones really spending any money or any time anymore chasing the Loch Ness Monster or Mokili Mbembe are creationists. Why do you think they would do this? This is very bizarre, because they think that somehow if they find a dinosaur in the Congo, all of evolution will be overthrown, which shows you how little they know about evolution, okay? And if you ever saw the series of Monster Quest about Count Lake Bembe, where I was the token skeptic with three minutes of time in an hour, uh, the entire rest of the video is this guy William Gibbon and his colleagues blundering around, showing that any trained field biologist, they were incompetent, uh, doing the exact worst possible way to find the animal they were looking for. And you say, oh, well, yeah, they're a creationist, but they only listen to their audience. Well, the lower right slide, if you heard about it, they're now pushing the idea of promoting the Loch Ness Monster in Louisiana science education, because that is part of the creation's agenda. So there are consequences, in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Don. That was excellent. Uh, I do want to take a moment because Karen wasn't able to be here to remind you that her book, Haunting America, is available for e-download. Excellent book as well. It's, a, it's an e-book, so it's not as substantial as this, but the content's great. So please give that a shot. Um, so let's just start out our panel with um, a question that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm going to address this to Daniel, but then we'll go across. With all the serious, potentially harmful things out there, uh, bad ideas, bad pseudoscience, bad attempts at science that can harm people. Why should skeptics be interested in, in Bigfoot? What's the value of Bigfoot skepticism? Uh, I, think there are, I think there are a number of answers to that. Um, one is pretty obvious uh, that a lot of people believe in Bigfoot. A lot of people believe in all of these creatures. Uh, belief in Bigfoot is in the U.S. and Canadian population around 20% of the population. 
Um, that's uh, you know two or three percent of people who are definitely convinced, and uh, you know roughly seventeen percent of people who uh, believe that it's very probably real. Um, that's a lot of people, you know. And uh, uh, when when you have an idea that is that prevalent in the population, I, I think it's worth the time of a few critical specialists to look at that question. Um, you know, I, I, I advocate for this kind of skepticism, but I don't, I don't uh, insist that every skeptic take up Bigfoot as their personal, personal bugbear, you know. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's just having a, a handful of specialists, uh, ideally for each of these strange ideas, these pseudoscientific or fringe science ideas, uh, we should have specialists in homeopathy and ufology and you know, monsterology and all kinds of nonsenseologies, you know. Uh, that's, I, that's what I think we're doing here. Um, there's also the uh, creationist angle that was just mentioned. Um, you know, like the Mokele and Bembe, for example, really is a creature of and for and by missionaries. It, it, so that's, that's really why the legend is, exists and is propagated at this point. Um, it's, it's funded by uh, fundamentalist uh, creationists, and it's pursued in the hope of, of uh, bringing, down, bringing down evolution, which, as John mentioned, is a forlorn hope, uh, you know, <laughs> as, as sharks and, <laughs> uh, you know, most of the creatures around uh, don't. Crocodiles. <laughs> Sharon, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I would agree with Daniel in that there are, there are so many people involved, and if you're involved at all in the community, you'd realize that many of these people are extremely serious and put an enormous amount of time and effort and, and sometimes money in, into this hobby, serious hobby that they have. It could, and it's interesting, and it grabs the media attention, these stories, no matter how credible they are, the media still loves to put them out there. Uh, for me, I, I have been interested in cryptozoology since I was a kid, and I think that another point to be made is that kids are interested in monsters, and this is a good way to bring kids into the idea of skeptical thinking and, and critical thinking about, is this real? And, and I, I think a lot of us have done that with, with our own kids and have had success in showing them how to think about this issue uh, and the evidence that, it, that, that is out there. But yeah, I think the that most... Is if I may, that, that is why so many junior skeptics start with a monster hook. It's, you know, kids, <laughs> kids like monsters. You know? yeah, it's, it's a great... Uh, and and grown-ups. Yeah. I mean, grown-ups like monsters, yeah. you know. And, and, and right now, with, with Bigfoot is huge right now. I he's mean, really he's big. He's so yes. big. Yes, he's very large. <laughs> <laughs> he's all over television, and uh, the, the media just loves him. And I think what it's portrayed, the search for Bigfoot is portrayed as a scientific endeavor. And a lot of this, what this book is about, shows that it's a really poor representation of how science works. And it's being portrayed as science in these media TV shows like Monster Quest and Finding Bigfoot. And it's just awful. And I, I do have this concern that kids or adults watching this on TV are thinking, that's the way science works. And it's just really bad. Yeah, I think that hits on a meta issue that uh, television shows in general, uh, which purport to be scientific have the issue that all that's editorially controlled, even if they have scientists in the, yep. uh, the content generation, that the editorial control is done by non-scientists. So, mm -hmm. And if you've seen it on TV, it must be. Real. Well, yeah, there's a lot of that. No, I, I have really good friends who are very intelligent who believe that Ghost Hunters is a scientific show. So. Yeah. Or, or mermaids, yes. Or, 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 <laughs> Just well, last month. Don't lose track of mermaids. I'm going to come That's back. right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll amplify what they both said. Uh, but a different thing that's obvious is that the way the media is now fractured, you have this giant race of unfiltered news 24-7 over thousands of different channels, and every possible electronic device you own seems to be a filter for news. And uh, so the, the sad part is, if it bleeds, it leads. It's always been a standard of journalism. M Bigfoot or any monster captures media attention, captures an audience. And the challenge is, hopefully, that one or more of us who are the other side will eventually get our voice heard so that these guys will at least get, you know, the token skeptic, my three minutes in an hour program is better than we usually get, but at least that's the, the part of the job we're hopefully in position to do. Um, because otherwise, as Sharon said, it basically creates a false notion of how science works. In her words, it's science-y, you know, they, they imitate the science trappings without actually really doing the method of science. And we need to get 
the public in general more aware of what real scientists do and how it doesn't resemble their stuff at all? I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm soft on monsters, to, honestly, because I come from monsters. You know, I, I, I love this stuff as a kid. I love it now. Uh, is, you know, for me, it's just a continuation of my childhood love of paranormal mysteries. The skeptical work I do is just the same thing, a little bit better. You know, I, I, I'm just continuing the same work. Um, it can have a cost. People do get killed uh, doing these kind of monster monster pursuits. Uh, a case recently where someone was uh, run over in the in the uh, execution of a Bigfoot hoax. Uh, there is a human cost. Uh, sometimes uh, lives are destroyed. Uh, in the you know in the vain vain pursuit of, of uh, these will of the wisp kind of legends, uh, but even if there were no cost, uh, these would still be interesting things to study. You know these are these paranormal ideas have shaped our culture. Western culture has been shaped by UFOs and Bigfoot, and and uh, and these are ideas that nonetheless have been largely neglected by other scholarships. So it it falls on us to do that work. I, I think that's useful. I agree. I, I think also, from my own perspective, that, that the world of uh, cryptozoology and paranormal investigation is the world of belief writ small. I mean, each of these beliefs, you'll see the same sort of techniques used uh, to defend them, whether successfully or unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully uh, in, in religious approaches or uh, paranormal approaches or, or cryptozoological, which theoretically shouldn't be paranormal. Um, but. Everyone in the audience has the opportunity to get onto the internet and argue for or against uh, any particular claim that comes out. So I guess a question I have is, how should we comport ourselves as skeptics uh, when engaging with people who believe these things? And I'm going to address that to Sharon first. Uh, yeah. It's your belly wiggle, right? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, my philosophy <laughs> is that I, I don't want to disparage people's experiences and their beliefs. Um, they have these experiences and they're interpreting them in terms of, say, a Bigfoot encounter. They've had a scary experience out in their backyard or out in the, out in the woods or camping. And um, because of the cultural aspect, they interpret it in terms of this monster. And uh, I can't change their interpretation and I wasn't there to have their experience either. Um, but they were obviously extremely affected by it and, and rather scared and they don't know what to think about it most of the time. Um, so I, I try to be really sympathetic to their beliefs. Uh, as I talked about it in my talk on Friday, I try to be that honest broker and give them some ideas about what could, could be an alternative. Uh, you're dealing with, with a, 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 a belief that's so strong that you're not going to be able to undo that with just your commentary. But I try to be fair. I, I, People know me as the skeptic, but they also know that I'm not going to call them crazy. I'm not going to say that they're lying because I don't think either one of those things. I think they've had a personal experience that they've interpreted in their own way, so I'm trying to be sympathetic to that. Doesn't always work. Um, there are nasty believers just as much as there are nasty uh, debunking skeptics who are, are you know, will, will, will brush people off. So you, you're going to have those extremes in, in either population, but I just try to try to be in the middle. Doesn't always work. I understand. Uh, D Dan, do you have anything to say about tone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this is a topic I, I address quite often, and uh, my approach is just to be uh, professional at all costs, at all times, and uh, and empathetic, uh, particularly uh, because, uh, as Sharon just mentioned, um, a lot of the time, uh, people people believe. Well, Sagan said. Uh, pe people are not stupid. They believe things for reasons, and and that's true. Uh, people don't just you know mostly just pick things out of the air. Uh, they've had things that, that shape these beliefs in their lives, and and a visceral personal experience is very compelling. You know, if you say Bigfoot, you will believe in Bigfoot, and it, <laughs> uh, and it, and that will that would convince you in this room. Um, you know, you are unlikely to see Bigfoot because you are not set up that way. But many people are. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to argue with that uh, kind of thing. And, and in, a, in a way, I don't really have a right to. You know, I, I was not there. I did not see what you saw. Uh, so I try and approach those conversations with, uh, with transparency about the limits of my knowledge involving the case we're discussing. Don? 
Because you actually engage with these people, not just online, but in real life. Yeah, every once in a while. Um, I battle creationists far longer, and there's a lot of similarities. In fact, we saw the largest, some cases, overlapping populations. Um, and in both cases, you really aren't going to make a lot of uh, headway being the hardcore skeptic. You know these people have a deep set need to believe something. And this is either a directly religious belief or it's a quasi-religious belief, but it's not something that the reason will easily dissuade them of. Uh, so the best you can do is, as we've both said already, is be professional, be clear, uh, you know, point to resources where they can see the other side, uh, try to explain why scientists in this case don't take certain cryptids very seriously, and you really don't have much power beyond that. I mean, you know, we're not going to convert the whole world, and that's a, a pipe dream. We just do the best we can. I do have some success in like asking those questions, just uh, just questioning what these. Uh, just questioning, let's say, like Bigfoot experts, you know, people who are blogging or writing on the topic, and you just ask them these basic questions, like you could do in any paranormal setting. Just asking them those questions is uh, very revealing, because often they don't have good answers. <laughs> and you're always thinking about the people on the outside who are just watching and maybe have not made up their mind yet, so you're, you're, you're doing that for them as well. I think, um, in my experience, the people who have got a personal uh, experience of having seen something that they can't explain or that they feel was probably a real Bigfoot is much different from someone like myself who hasn't, but has just a, a general curiosity uh, about the topic. So that it's, 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 quite, it's quite different, uh, the engagement process. I suppose this is uh, analogous to someone who's experienced a miracle versus people who've heard about a miracle. Um, and I think the, the parallels between religiosity and cryptozoology um, in, in the way that the, uh, the believers believe is, 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 is the same. I don't really know how else to put it. Uh, Matt Crowley, our, our friend and colleague, uh, says that many Bigfooters treat it as a religion. And I think uh, the indignation that, that you receive online when you engage with these folks if, uh, seems disproportionate for how serious the claim would be outside of the context of that conversation. So, and I think a lot of that comes from that, uh, that kind of a situation. Uh, so this understream of, of cryptozoology and creationism being mixed together, I was aware of it before I started Monster Talk, but I, it just keeps coming up again and again and again. So I, I was going to ask, you know, why won't Michele Mbembe disprove evolution? But I'm going to change that question. <laughs> and I'm going to say, what cryptid would best disprove evolution? Don. OK. <laughs> um. There's a famous quote, I think it was to, to Haldane or someone saying, you know, what kind of thing would disprove evolution of the fossil record? And uh, there's something the answer along the line, a fossil horse in the Cambrian. It's not that animals could uh, live, you know, past when we think they're extinct, because we know that does happen. Uh, it just makes us twist our story a little differently when we discover they did not, in fact, go extinct. But what really is crucial to our understanding of evolution and our, uh, our confidence that it's real is that the fossil record has a very clear-cut sequence, sequence of animals through time. And if there were something really remarkable that was unquestionably you know, in place, not something that accidentally introduced or some kind of hoax, uh, that would be uh, indeed a true falsification of at least part of our understanding of evolution. That's not what they're talking about here. So you're saying mermaids, right? Yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah well, I'm mermaids would be mermaids. very interesting. Yeah. They violate all sorts of biological right. laws, yes. <laughs> I would also add um, a good example, a recent example, is, is the catch of interpretation of the DNA. I was actually about to ask you about that. Okay. The, the, the interpretation of the DNA, uh, you, should, you should have an animal that, has a, that fits into our, our, our existing scheme of things. What, what DNA is this? Should we introduce yeah, let me, that? Let me, let me back up. Yeah. So, so recently, I think that there's always been um, a, an issue of anecdotal evidence versus hard scientifically in, in, uh, evaluatable evidence um, in cryptozoology. And so up until uh, this recent DNA study, uh, hair samples uh, and, and prints are really the, the best evidence that's been available and some grainy photographs in one uh, amazingly confusing movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this DNA study had been, uh, there were rumors that someone had DNA and they were going to be doing a real scientific study. Sharon, how did that play out? Oh gosh, not very well. <laughs> uh, a good example of how not to do science and what science is not, I, I think. Uh, 
Uh, she did, uh, uh, a veterinarian, Dr. Melba Ketchum, she did collect many samples from across the country. Uh, they were sent to her and she ran them through a, a, a DNA test and the results, are just, it's way too long a story to talk about, so I'm, I'm not gonna really talk about the details, but the, the end result is that she came out with a result that showed that Bigfoot would be a hybrid between a, a some ancestral uh, primate, unknown, I guess proto Bigfoot, whatever, and then a, 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 a female human. Um, the DNA ended up looking like bits and pieces of different DNA all mixed together panda, opossum, all sorts of animals, and bits of you know, human off the, 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 the uh, certain chromosome. And um, it's exactly what you would expect if it was a mixture of pieces of DNA that had been degraded out in the environment. Her <laughs> interpretation was that it's a whole new animal. It's a whole new thing. However, it, you, if you find a whole new animal, it should fit into the pattern of evolution that we already know about. It should fit into the DNA database in a way that makes sense. This did not in any way. So you're saying primates don't become marsupials later, <laughs> if I'm understanding you right. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, possibly DNA was part of it, yes. So, but they, so, Bigfoot do fall asleep if you scare them? <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, like, <laughs> I'd so, rather the puns, okay? Yeah. Okay, okay, I got it, all right. So, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, that, that, um, it, it eventually came out that she may be, believe that Bigfoot are um, the Nephilim. You know, the angels yep. that were, she's very religious. Again, we've got this religious theme going through this conversation and it, it just gets weird. And it just doesn't, it just doesn't fit into what we know. It, it did play out, it was a big disappointment, I think, for everyone who wanted to see uh, DNA evidence thoroughly evaluated. Although there's another DNA study going on that's still uh, during, it's, being, it's in, in process right now. Right, that's Todd Sykes, he's, he's working on that. Todd Sykes, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, working in the U in the UK, uh, collecting samples from all across the world, I think. Yeah. And he <laughs> is he actually does have a bit more credibility to do such a study than uh, Dr. Ketchum did. I think he has a, a good reputation, I think, and uh, yes. it'll be interesting to see how this plays out as a comparison. Um, yes, it will. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear the results to that. Um, so can cryptozoology be science? Uh, yeah, um, this is something Daniel and I both put in at length in the final chapter of the book. Um, the problem is, is that cryptozoology has almost always come from amateur, you know, interest, you know, enthusiasts, which is not bad because amateurs do contribute to many areas of science. But to do science right, there is a scientific method. Uh, and then one of the key things in scientific method is we try to be very careful about things like data collection, about how we analyze samples, uh, if possible, you know, run a, a third uh, sample or a blind or something like that so you don't know what you're doing, which of course Ketchum didn't do. Um, and try as best you can not to fool yourself, I guess is the famous uh, quotation from, uh, from uh, Richard Feynman. These people, of course, want to believe anything that they find that confirms their view, viewpoint, of course, not anything else. And the scientist is not in that game. The scientist has to face the evidence and if it goes against what he or she already thinks, an honest scientist has got to change their mind. An honest scientist has to recognize that something is uh, not what they thought it was. And that's one of the first places we see this failure of scientific method. It doesn't matter what evidence is out there, it will always fit their viewpoint as Bigfoot is real or whatever. Um, and then there's a whole series of other things basic to science. But the biggest problem, and Daniel pointed this out again and again, is there's a tendency in, in the crypto literature to just pile on story after story after story with no real attempt to weed out what's good and what's bad. Even when they themselves have committed, okay, well this study is obviously a hoax. It shows up again in the next paper as if they never learned anything. And this is the same way the creationists are. They won't correct mistakes. And that's a serious issue. Scientists are not allowed to get away with that. I'll let Daniel pick up that theme actually. There, there is this uh, creationist thread that, that runs through cryptozoology, which uh, we discuss in the book, which is otherwise not discussed very much in the literature. Um, and that, that is part of the kind of the fabric of cryptozoology. But one of the things that makes cryptozoology fun is that it, it, uh, it can be scientific. It, you know, it, 
the basic project of cryptozoology is, you know, it uh, uh, goes with it goes with the ethos of science. They're trying to find evidence. Um, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to overturn the laws of physics for Bigfoot to be real. You just have to find Bigfoot, and <laughs> you know, and you can do that using ordinary kind of scientific uh, means. You know, a big net maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it it, uh, it is fun, uh, but it, it's also uh, extremely primitive and, and likely to remain that way because it, it's not fruitful. So it doesn't it doesn't really invite uh, that much serious uh, scientific interest. It did previously, you know, there there has been a, a kind of a scientific history of monsterology uh, in the 19th century, especially there was very serious uh, interest in uh, sea serpents, which we discuss in the book. Um, but because it doesn't go anywhere, uh, you know, it, uh, it is left largely in the hands of amateurs. And they, as, as Don mentioned, have the critical problem of uh, never, ever, ever cutting the bad apples out of, out of their... Well, they, they, Bigfooters love to talk about the, the Bigfoot database, the sighting database. Uh, go to the primary evidence. They, they're always shouting at the skeptics. But, you know, it's not a database. It's just a big, messy pile. And, and, and everybody knows that there's a ton of hoaxes in there, a lot of complete baloney. And if you press, if you press cryptozoologists on this, they, they will sometimes admit that as many as 90% of, and you know, ufologists will say the same thing about their database, um, as many as 90% of the, the cases, the sighting cases uh, and uh, footprint cases are baloney. But they don't know which ones, and the literature never makes any effort to find out. You know, it just it just keeps piling, and uh, so as long as that's true, uh, cryptozoology will never never advance as a scientific pursuit, although it could. I studied um, amateur paranormal investigators, and in that group, I included cryptozoologists along with ghost hunters and UFO uh, chasers, and. Um, I asked, what, what I did was I looked at, see how they used the word science in, in their portrayal and their methodology, and it was very poor. They used it, they used it about more than half the time in my survey, but the way they used it was in, incorrect or very weak, or as, as Susan Hack talked about yesterday, as an honorific way of making it sound good. And um, one thing I noticed was that not many of them were scientists or had scientific training. Computer science doesn't count. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> but they, that's, that, oh, yes, I, I have computer science. Them right. fighting words. <laughs> just, I'm just being, I'm just being, I'm just clarifying. <laughs> and um, one thing I noticed uh, in, in the way that they, they approached this is that it, the, the approach was wrong. The question maybe is not uh, about cryptozoology, about a cryptid. It's what happened, if anything, in this situation where somebody says they had this experience. So the paranormal investigators of whatever type go into these investigations thinking, I'm going to find evidence for X, paranormal, cryptid, whatever. No, the question is, what if anything happened here? And they start off immediately by narrowing their options and going down that path, which is the wrong path. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, go, you go to Ben Radford's book on scientific paranormal investigations and it shows you that that's not the way you should approach these problems if you really want the answer. <laughs> and so I get this feeling that the, the cryptozoologists as well as the ghost hunters uh, are, are particularly bad at this, are looking for a particular answer. It's sham inquiry. It's, right. it's putting the answer before the evidence and looking for the evidence to fit the answer. Well, you know, in, in astronomy, there's a, a really robust body of amateur astronomers who contribute right. to the science. So, why aren't there amateur naturalists who are working in cryptozoology and contributing to the, the body of work? Well, or, or wait, are there? Aren't you one? But <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose I am. Yeah. Except he hasn't traveled in the woods anymore looking for it. But him. seriously, yeah, it just seems like there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's no pressure for improvement in, in the body of uh, written work anyway. Well, I mean, with, uh, you know, in, in fields where there is the structure of like a core of Professional academics, and then a, a you know a larger body of, of uh, serious amateur practitioners. Um, there is a core of academics, and <laughs> uh, cryptozoology largely doesn't have that. I mean, it has occasionally invited uh, interest, it has occasionally attracted interest uh, from individual academics who have some kind of relevant training, but but there is no community of, of uh, serious scientists. Anybody can be cryptozoologists. Oh yeah, you just, yeah, you're, you're all know, cryptozoologists. I was called a cryptozoologist. <laughs> 
and there's I not even I mean there's not even a well publicized guidance on how to collect evidence safely there's nothing no, no. Yeah, so they, they had that at one time too um, as, as Daniel mentioned uh, you know people like Roy Mackle and so on were actual PhDs in fields sort of cryptozoology but Roy Mackle was a microbiologist and that he was spending all his time chasing Magellan Magembe and, and uh, plesiosaurs in Loch Ness which are not the same thing okay a biology degree is not a universal passport to do anything and uh, that was a the problem. They had academics with uh, a handful of them with really inappropriate training, which made them just amateurs effectively. And most of that core of the people who used to take cryptology seriously among professionals is all passed on now. Their journal has gone extinct. Uh, it's almost 100% amateurs now. I, I, I think I should take a moment here to, to plug Brian Regal's book because it ties yeah. into the topic really well. So if you get a chance to look at Brian Regal's book on Crack pots. Searching for Sasquatch. Uh, egghead, eggheads and crack pots. Yeah, egghead and crack pots. Yeah. If you look for eggheads and crack pots, Brian Regal, you'll find it. It's a great, uh, really detailed overview. Uh, I think this book has more citations, though. You should get this one. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, he heavier <laughs> citations. Too. Yeah. So he has a lot of citations. So, but you, you've got him beaten size anyway. So, it's, that was one of the things that bugged me. You, you know, we talk about stories after stories. You go to the popular cryptozoology literature, like the stuff that's found in the library for, for like middle school kids. And you just pick it up, and it's the same recycled stories over yep. and over again. And there isn't one citation in the whole no. book. No, no. And, and, and this occur, another problem is, as you've alluded to, things that have already been thoroughly disproven continue to be promoted as the real. And that's, we, on Monster Talk, we call that the echo chamber of paranormal literature. But right. uh, it's true for cryptozoology as well. And true uh, creationism, too. Yeah, Their right. arguments never change after 50 years. Yeah, so, and, and I think one of the best things about science is you continuously try to find out what's wrong and then remove that from the body. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a real issue with the, with the whole topic. But hopefully you'll listen to Monster Talk and find out what's going on next. Um, <laughs> We have time for some questions. Sure. Um, uh, so what do I need to do to make that happen, George? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of time, a little bit of time. Let's form a line, please, if we could, real quick. Number one right here. Here we go. Hi, Sharon. Hi, guys. Um, they know, but maybe not everyone knows, that I belong to a Bigfoot hunting group called the Bigfoot Club. And I'd like to thank Finding Bigfoot because now they think they need a skeptic. Nice. <laughs> and the fact that I'm a girl helps. But what I found is that we'll come up with ideas, like we spent all winter looking for Bigfoot prints in the snow, very methodically, and I helped them set this up. And I was the only one that found some weird footprints, which disappointed them. But what we don't take into account is how much of a social group it is, yeah. how much fun we have saying goodbye to our spouses. <laughs> We're gonna go camp in the woods and have fun. And to give that up is, would be very, very difficult yeah. for them. And that's what I found, is that the, the social atmosphere is so important. Yeah. So I just I, wanted to I wanted that. to join uh, some paranormal investigation groups, but they wouldn't have me, so I was a little bit involved. <laughs> that's true, uh, they don't so want to So maybe someday. So. Yeah, the, yeah, the community aspect is a big part of it. For the same reason a lot of churches you know, hold their people. It's a community. It's yeah. more than the, the dogma. It's about your friends. Okay. Um, even if there aren't people, scientific people, going out and look, looking for your particular cryptozoids, um, wouldn't people like birders who are out doing surveys of birds, if they saw something that looked like a Bigfoot, uh, wouldn't they report it to somebody? Uh, wouldn't the loggers, I realize they're not scientific, but have any loggers ever reported that while they were clear cutting that they saw something big running away? If Daniel's a herder, he should tell us. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, that, that uh, goes to my personal history. I, I grew up on clear cuts in, in uh, British Columbia, and uh, I spent my first career as a shepherd uh, working on clear cuts again far out in the wilderness uh, up along the BC side of the Alaska Panhandle. Um, we saw some pseudo Bigfoot. And, uh, what are those? Uh, those are generally stumps. <laughs> they have a they have an aqueous counterpart too, don't they? <laughs> they do, they do. Um, but yeah, the, uh, people don't realize how well traveled those areas are. I mean, the the entire, you know, the the, the forest of North America is a gridded up commodity. Uh, it has been logged and relogged and relogged and regrown and regrown and regrown. The whole thing is is. Civilized, you know. There, there's wilderness out there, but there are also people out there. 
Um, so yeah, you, you would expect a much more robust. Uh, I wanted to comment on that too. There, there's a huge body of what should have been evidence that hasn't really been studied very much by Bigfooters, I don't think, but that's uh, grizzly bear researchers have hair yeah. traps all over the Pacific Northwest and have been doing surveys and studies on those for years and have never reported finding strange, you know, unrecognizable hairs that I'm aware of and I've that's been right. trying to find out, so. Yeah. Well, there's this kind of basic paradox in cryptozoology that these, these cryptids seem like plausible possibilities because many people see them, but because many people see them, we should have concrete evidence, yes. and, and uh, there's just no getting around that tension. It's, it's a problem for crypto. crypto Thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. From a uh, psychiatrist's point of view, a vexing question that pervades just about every topic of this entire meeting is what are the boundaries between delusion and mere credulity uh, or suggest uh, yeah. suggestibility? Uh, I, I could suggest many answers to that question, but I'm much more interested in knowing the panel's point of view. Yeah, if, if someone else says it, it's probably delusion. Yeah. But yeah. If, if I say it... Well, and that's, a, that's part of what science is about. I mean, an individual scientist can believe all sorts of things, and there are many classic cases of individual scientists going off the deep end with some belief system. But in the scientific community, the point is we are self-checking. We have peer review. We have many other ways in which you can, if you have a solid case, more than one person should be able to see it. And so usually, if there's no evidence beyond the individual claims to see something, it's mostly by peer review that weeds it out. And that's pretty much the way we take that thing. Oh, and, and also, the, I would say there's a, a really like three demarcations within cryptozoology that I'm aware of. And one is the, the natural uh, reality ones, you know, biology inspired people, uh, the, the paranormalists, and then the uh, creationists. And none of those three really like to get along with each other, that's although right. they're all interested in the same topic. So that's, <laughs> that's a true division within the groups. Oh yeah, I, I wrote about that. It's called Supernatural Creep, when um, their idea of Bigfoot, it, they can't think of anything natural that would account for certain things, like why he just disappears or why he can't Although delusion caught. does seem... Yeah, <laughs> and, and they end up moving towards supernatural yeah. explanations exactly. instead. So there's this horrible thing happening. We've got time for one there. more question. Okay. Um, how come most of the cryptids tend to be huge, monstrous creatures rather than small things like six-legged frogs, which would be much more justifiable in, in, in terms of even existing? What is it about the psychology of having these monstrous creatures? Well, they're, they're that much awesomer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they also tend to be like hybrids. Like, the, you know, they have a head of a horse and a body of a kangaroo and a right. tail of a dragon. So they, they have all these hybrid characteristics, which also goes against evolution, doesn't make yeah. any sense. And no, no genetic mechanism whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think even before the formal study of, if it is formal, of cryptozoology, uh, the, the, a lot of these sightings fit into the folklore, uh, yeah. and our folklore is full of, of uh, spectacular monsters and giants uh, in every culture, as far as I can tell. So um, I think, uh, but there's even eight, thousands of years ago, the story of the six-legged toe was not very popular. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Daniel, I wrote all about that. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, going, going back to the previous question about, about belief, you know, there, there is quite a literature within skepticism and of course a larger literature within wider psychology about why people believe things. Uh, my boss at Skeptic Magazine, uh, Michael Shermer, has spent a lot of his career working on this question of why people believe weird things and, and in fact why people believe anything. Um, for myself, you know, I, I, uh, I know sheep and art and monsters, uh, <laughs> and that I, job. yeah, <laughs> um, and uh, I can, I can best speak to why I believed uh, in monsters, and in fact, most of it, I believed in most paranormal things, and that's because they really seemed legit, you know, uh, as a, you, if you just walk in off the street, they sound pretty good, and, and uh, that's, that's why I believed it. And, I, I had a particular hook in my, in my family history as well because my, my parents saw a cryptid called, uh, called Cadbrosaurus, which is the lo local Pacific Northwest iteration of the great, great sea serpent of the North Atlantic. So uh, that, that, was a, uh, that was pretty compelling. I think, I think uh, George is about to uh, shake us off the stage. So sure. uh, Dan, Sharon, Don, thank you so much for being thank here. You. Please buy a copy of this book. There's only a few out there. Grab one of them. Bigfoot panel, thank you so much.